In today's episode, we're going to be unpacking the somewhat historical moment that is currently taking place in judicial systems across the globe. We're going to be using South Africa and the United States as relevant case studies to identify the parallels and diversions, if any, um, in both countries regarding the nomination, recommendation, and ultimate appointment of justices to the Supreme Court of Appeal and Constitutional Court, uh, which are the apex courts in the United States of America and South Africa, respectively. And of course, I can never leave you without offering free stuff at the end of the show. So we're getting into that. You know that's my favorite segment. If you've never heard my voice before, before, never seen my face. Hi, my name is Lele, Lele Mutari. I can be found at Lele Mutari underscore on Twitter and on Instagram if you're ever looking to find me on social media. Uh, otherwise, uh, everything important will always be linked in the description and the most exciting part of the show, which is your incisive contribution, can always be left in the comments section. So don't forget to do that for me, please. I can't wait to hear your take on everything that I sink my teeth into today. Thank you so much for joining me uh, for this one. I cannot wait. Let's jump into it. Welcome. If you missed the last episode, um, what are you doing? <laughs> if you missed the last episode, we got into a lot of... Um, don't do that though. Don't, don't, don't be missing episodes, but um, go check that out. We got into a lot of interesting stuff, um, chief of them being that uh, very controversial bill that was making the rounds in the news um, very recently, Bill C-4, uh, the Canadian legislation that outlaws... Um, conversion therapy and that very sketch definition of conversion therapy in that legislation which essentially arguably um, outlaws Christianity and as I argued in that episode uh, might even outlaw the whole canon of Abrahamic religious doctrine um, and religious teachings I get into a lot of other interesting things that you should probably find out about in that episode, episode 24, so go ahead and do that. Otherwise, in terms of today's agenda, we're speaking essentially about the fight for the judiciary, right? So there seems to be a kind of affirmative action happening on court benches across the globe, right? We're speaking now, uh, in reference to, to South Africa, we're speaking about the JSC appointments, um, in, in South Africa and the Supreme Court appointments in, in America. If you've been keeping your eye um, on the news, your ear to the ground, uh, you may have heard something in recent times regarding Joe, Joe Biden's sentiments around who he might nominate, a potential nominee to the Supreme Court. And although he hasn't decided, he hasn't forwarded a name, he has definitely uh, resolved, concluded that it will be a black female, right? So he is going to make good on his campaign promise, essentially, uh, to nominate the first black uh, female justice to the Supreme Court. Um, and so um, that's that's got very interesting um, consequences and undertones and very interesting uh, effects, I think, in terms of how uh, the judiciary operates. We even get into this episode, uh, we get into the role of the judiciary and, and why the appointments of the people who sit on those benches are so important in terms of the role that they're supposed to play when they are actually occupying those positions. You'll actually remember on the score that we did an episode a few episodes ago uh, where we discussed Martin Krokam, the High Court ju uh, ju Judge Martin Krokam, who uh, for 10 years was, was fighting a legal battle uh, because um, he's essentially um, they, they, he, he's, he, he was in an acting capacity um, at, at the High Court because there they was just, okay, the, the argument was that there was just no suitable can, candidate, right? I believe the minister at the time um, who was in charge of appointing him was Minister Jackson Utembu. And, um, and, the, and the argument from the, from, from the presidency, from the government, was that there are just no suitable or appropriate candidates, right? Um, and imagine hearing that response, um, with having your name be the only one on that recommendation list or your name being forwarded as the nominee or the recommendation 
and hearing back that, well, there's just no one, um, you know, suitable for that position for 10 years running, right? So, but essentially, uh, he, uh, that he came out victorious. He, he was essentially uh, appointed in a permanent position. And I covered that. I mean, you can find the episode, the, his name is literally in the title. So you can get into that. Uh, I speak um, more in depth with a lot more detail because now I'm, I'm speaking in vague terms. So I'm kind of, I'm not doing that uh, story any justice, but check that out. So go ahead and dig through the playlist and check that out. But essentially, why should you care, right? I want to start there. Why should you even care? Um, and I think that the most poignant way that I can answer that question about why you should care about all of this, right? Why should you care about who, who gets nominated and how anyone gets nominated to the Supreme Court in America and the Constitutional Court in South Africa and even the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa and any other, um, um, any other court, really, um, in South Africa? I would answer that question by asking you to or at least by advising you to ask yourself why the other side cares, right? So, because the other side does care, the other side being the left. The left certainly cares, right? The people who want the first black woman, the first black this, the first black gay, transgender, um, minority, non-binary, Mexican immigrant, they, they care, right? They care a lot, and so why do they care? Right, because we can't deny that they want the judiciary with the burning intensity of a thousand suns. Right, we can't deny that there actually is a war on truth and reality. Um, and in fact, surprisingly, the, the, the war itself is a fact of reality, but a lot of people don't believe so. Right, um, it's very real, it's very immediate, um, and the fact that even this ongoing war is a point of contention in and of itself um, that people, I've got a fly um, that's joined us um, for the episode. If you're watching the visuals, uh, please welcome our friend of the show <laughs> who's just buzzing around. Uh, but so people, even, even the fact that there is a war on reality is a point of contention. People chop it down uh, to um, issues of tolerance, right? Just be tolerant, um, you know, just, just um, accept diversity and transformation. Um, so it's tolerance at best and political correctness at worst, right? That's the extent of the widespread confusion that has permeated society. People aren't even seeing what is happening, right? People aren't seeing that we are literally contending for truth, right? That's the extent of moral depravity um, in our society. We essentially, I am making this podcast and I'm trying to answer these questions because we cannot, we absolutely cannot afford to surrender the courts to leftist demagoguery. We absolutely cannot afford uh, for our places of judicial, legal adjudication um, to become cultural Marxist think tanks. We can't afford for that to happen. Um, that would be the point of no return, right? So let's attack the idea of diversity. Um, let's attend to that. When we hear that um, what benches should be what exactly does that mean, right? Diversity of what exactly? Diversity of resources, um, diversity of views, of political positions. What exactly do we want a diversity of? Because when you pay close attention to the examples um, that are actually forward right, in these discussions, when when these people who purport to want diversity, when they when they make Emissions, uh, what you hear that diversity seems to be explicitly non white, right? It seems to be explicitly non cis heterosexual and it seems to be explicitly non conservative, right? So I'll ask the question again diversity of what? Okay, um, so think on that. I'll let you chew on that, but I'll move on to the next point, right? That being of transformation. What does transformation even mean, right? And I've, I've gone into the idea of transformation in the podcast before, so I won't lament on it too much. 
um, particularly transformation in, in, in the legal framework. I've spoken about transformative constitutionalism uh, and the fact that transformation in this context, in the legal framework, uh, particularly with, in terms of the judiciary and the, and the constitution and judicial adjudication, um, where transformative constitutionalism is applied as an approach uh, to judicial adjudication and judicial um, or in, um, application and legislative interpretation, um, it means substantial equality, it means equity, right? It means um, equality of outcome. And this is informed, of course, um, by, um, a, a, well, this is informed by, and it's also a response to uh, the socioeconomic effects of apartheid, right? So that's obviously in the case of South Africa. Um, because of the effects of apartheid, because of the consequences of the laws of apartheid, um, the socioeconomic consequences, that is, um, the constitution of South Africa, the post- um, democratic, or at least the democratic constitution of South Africa coming into the new dispensation um, spoke to that, right? Responded to that reality, to those effects of apartheid uh, laws, of apartheid government. Um, and so we actually have entrenched in Chapter 2 of the constitution socioeconomic rights. That's why our constitution is lauded and applauded as being so progressive, right? Of being this shining beacon, right? Because it enshrines socioeconomic rights in the constitution itself, right? And we need to remember that in South Africa, the constitution is sovereign, right? We are a constitutional democracy. Uh, okay, so um, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that means that the mere application, right? The mere correct application of the Constitution should already see to um, socioeconomic uh, realities of people, right? Correcting the socioeconomic realities of people who have been on the back foot, right? Um, in terms of any historical um, uh, historical disadvantage, so that obviously brings apart, brings um, brings together, or at least that that obviously brings about the counter-majoritarian dilemma, right? Transformative constitutionalism, that is, brings about the counter-majoritarian dilemma, and I've spoken about this, and this is essentially the idea that um, the judges, the justices, aren't elected, right, by the majority, by the, de by the electorate, right? So the legislature is elected by the electorate, right? And so those are the people who make the laws, and so laws that are duly passed, i.e., you know, the Constitution, because even amendments to the Constitution count as laws, the Constitution is law, you know, um, the, so that, that's already taken care of. The law, as it stands, is the will of the people. And so why should you have um, these other people who occupy positions on court benches um, having all this leeway and freedom, uh, right, for transformative constitutionalism, right, when they're unelected, right, um, and, and they've got a very important role, right, no one can take that away. Um, in fact, we're, my side, I would argue, uh, cares more, cares so much more about that important role that judges and justices play because we're trying to protect it, right, um, and so we're just trying to be loyal to the principle of the separation of powers. But so I've, I've gone through the counter-majoritarian uh, dilemma in previous episodes. You can peruse previous episodes for that if you're looking for my thoughts on that. But so essentially the point here is the constitution of South Africa is already fundamentally transformative in nature. We don't actually need um, such an extreme transformative constitutionalist approach, right, in the first place. But then we also need to consider what actually is the role of the court, right? Um, and what is the role of judges on court benches, right? Because this, the answer to this question or to those two questions will be what informs the method of their appointment or at least should be what informs the method of their appointment, right? Um, and so we'll get into that in a little bit. But I want to address this idea of this view, rather, of the law as a tool to oppress and perpetuate oppression. That law, or at least that view of law being used to oppress and perpetuate oppression, is a fundamentally left-wing idea. That is left-wing ideology. For. 
literally that derived from classical Marxism. If you've if you had encounters with Marxism, you know what I'm what we what where I'm going with this, right? Because it Marxism in the sense that superstructure, according to this to classical Marxist doctrine, adds to the dates of this, right? The base is the structure and law is one of the arts, the superstructure, um, and so the law basically adheres to the interest of whatever you know the base is, right? And typically the base has been identified uh, by the people who propose this idea to be patriarchal, to be male white capitalist, right? Um, so the idea is that the realities of life, we know them, um, so, uh, and the institutions of life as we know them are the direct effect of structures um, of long standing historical institutions which are just obeying particular interests, right? Uh, and most commonly, as I've said, those interests have, well, have been said to be the, the most commonly accused, right? Uh, interests of wh are white interests, capitalist interests, and patriarchal interests, right? Western interests as well. Um, so I, I just want I, I want you to keep that at the back of your mind, right? That this idea of law as a tool to oppress is fundamentally a left wing, not just left wing, but Marxist, classical Marxist ide ideology, right? It derives from that doctrine. Um, but let's go back to that idea, that that question of uh, what's the role of the court and and judges on court benches. Because this takes us to another conversation that we've been having in recent times about the rule of law, um, and you'll 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 hear my you'll hear my sentiments about that in a in a most recent in another recent episode. Um, I'll try to link all of these different episodes in the description, but if not, I swear there you will find them. We have definitely spoken about this, but this idea of the rule of law, right? So the rule of law is essentially the, a principle that says that uh, we are all equal, all men are equal. Well. People might have <laughs> difficulty or might have problems with that phrasing, but all men are equal under the law, right? Everyone is equal under the law, right? Men doesn't necessarily, I don't mean that in terms of males, obviously, I hope you understand. That. Um, I hope you can be mature about that. But so all men are equal under the law, right? And that obviously should include even those who adjudicate legal matters must be held to the standard of equality under the law, not just in applying the law, but even to themselves in terms of their own appointment uh, to benches, right? In fact, I would argue that even more so in terms of the appointment of those who are to see to it that all men are equal under the law in terms of the application of the law, right? Um, because judicial appointments are essentially a selection of the pool of knowledge, experience, and insight, right, that will adjudicate matters in the apex court, right? And, and I'm speaking now with particular reference to the apex courts because those are the courts that have been making, um, the, that have been in the news uh, because uh, of, of, of course, what Joe Biden said about his, nom his nominee, uh, for the Supreme Court, and of course, the JSC interviews in South Africa. Um, uh, Umamandi Samaya has just been rec recommended as as the um, as I guess the favoured um, candidate for the Chief Justice position in the Constitutional Court. So you'll you'll just hear me referencing Apex Courts, but really this applies to all courts um, anywhere, really. Um, but but so yeah, which which adjudicates uh, it, 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 judicial appointments are about the selection of that pool of knowledge, of insight, right, which adjudicates matters at that level, right, at that judicial level. And so having established that, the question that follows would be what distinct or unique knowledge does a black woman have or bring to the court which other identities do not and in fact cannot, right? Um, because what does it mean for you to say um, that it is time for black women, uh, we need a black woman on, on, a, on, on the, in the Supreme Court? And I'm speaking now, so, so here, I'll, and this is one of the diversions, right? I, I made a point in the about parallel diversions, and I've already made um, pointed to parallels and, and similarities in terms of what's 
in, in South Africa and in, a, in America on this issue. But here's an, an, a very important diversion that I think I'm actually quite proud of. Um, because in America, it seems quite explicit that literally the president is saying it is time for a black female justice to be on the Supreme Court bench. Whereas in South Africa, there just seems to be a resounding kind of sentiment. No one is outwardly, well, at least not the president, not that I've heard of, at least. I wouldn't be surprised, to be quite honest. But um, the president hasn't literally come out to say it is time for a female chief justice, you know what I mean? Because what would that mean, you know, as, especially because Mam Mandisa, and she's currently the, the Supreme Court of Appeal president, right? Um, but so what would it mean for her to hear that um, as the only female candidate, and then the president says, well, um, it's time for, for a female, like it does, it just seems like you're not giving me a go in the ring, right? You're not letting me take the other candidates on. You know, um, you're not giving you're not giving me a go on, on on my own merit. You know, it kind of seems like you don't trust me to make it on my own merit. I actually want to chance. I actually want to take on the white man. You know, that's how I would feel if I was a black woman in America who actually was looking at that uh, at that position on the on the Supreme Court bench. I actually want to take on the white man, the white woman, the black man. Right? I want to know. I want to sit there knowing that I actually went into the ring with them and I came out on top. You know, I don't want you to make any exceptions for me. I don't want you to make it easier for me. But so at least that's something that uh, we're not finding in South Africa, or at least not so overtly as it is in America at the, at the moment. But so what exactly does a black woman uh, bring, right, that is so unique and so distinct um, in, uh, in terms of knowledge, right, in terms of insight that other identities can't bring to the court bench? Um, would it be that black women perhaps um, have a unique and distinct understanding of the struggles of black women, and so that's why they're so important to have on court benches? Because my response would be simple. My response to that would be, any conscientious, well-informed, experienced, and seasoned judge who is worth their salt, right, would be sensitive to the struggles of any person, different groups of people, right, and would be able to apply the law in an appropriately discerning and even-handed fashion, right? So they wouldn't have to be a black woman um, to be able to do that. Anyone right, who is doing their job correctly, conscientiously, would be able to do that job, right, would be able um, to reach a, an even-handed outcome, right, um, which adheres to the rule of law, okay, so regardless of the legal issue and regardless of the litigants before, before them, any judge um, who's conscientious, who's well-informed, who's well-experienced, who's seasoned, right, um, in terms of legal interpretation, should be able to be sensitive uh, to that, right? Particularly one who would, in the case of South Africa and, the, and, and South Africa's constitution, particularly one who would be um, interpreting and applying that constitution um, appropriately, right? Um, so there's no unique advantage, I would argue, that a black woman has in this area, right? And that's why... The, the idea that a black woman, black women must be made space for, you know, they must, everyone must be cleared, we must clear a way for black women. It's kind of undermining. And this is why I enjoyed uh, Uma Mandisa's uh, response. Um, I was watching her interview. First of all, um, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't want anyone to, to, to take away from this that I'm against uh, black women, you know, in, on, on Supreme Court benches or anything like that, or particularly Uma Mandisa. I, I, I'm not too interested in, in any of the candidates, but honestly, um, since, I mean, since, of course, we've all learned that the recommendation of the JSC, I enjoyed her interview. She's got an illustrious very decorated legal career. She holds three uh, degrees, BPROC, LLB, LLM. She's uh, studied abroad. She, on, she's, I mean, she's well acclaimed. She's written incredible judgments. She's done amazing work. You can see the results of her work, man. She's articulate. Um, you know, I don't doubt that she'll do a great job. 
um she also she just she looks good for the position as well you know what i mean so but i don't think that has anything to do with the fact that she's a woman i think she is just the better candidate right and so anyway point is she was asked the question in her interviews um in her interview uh about whether she feels like south africa is ready for female chief justice and she alluded to the fact that it is kind of undermining that this this notion that uh women are a group that need to be protected and kind of you know are we ready for women i mean essentially her answer was well we've always the what does that question even mean right uh, she said she appreciates the question but it's kind of an a wrong the wrong question you know because what does it mean uh, has anyone ever asked um whether south africa was ready for a black male chief justice you know no one's ever asked that question and women have always been capable to lead at that level um and that was her response and i really enjoyed you know her view on that um so i think she she's yeah so i i think she's got a great and amazing um um sense of um discernment she's got amazing insights uh she's got an amazing head on her shoulders so i i i certainly don't have anything against her i've got something against these people who ask those questions right about is south africa ready you know south africa is ready and people say this also but south africa is ready for a female president what does that mean exactly you know what i mean so and these women who just jump on the wave right and are campaigning on that on the wave what does that even mean so like i wouldn't want that, but anyway that's that's just me but he said the argument or at least the side that that would submit that women do actually or black women does actually have some kind of unique advantage or at least a unique kind of knowledge or insight uh, that she would bring to the bench um would be the view or would be the side that espouses um standpoint epistemology right and we've gone into the idea of standpoint e- epistemology in the podcast before i'm actually i'm smiling because i'm realizing that the podcast is a lot like philosophy if you if you've studied philosophy um philosophy body of work it's very self referential right so you have to learning about other things to be able to get the context about the something capitalism will be tied you know um opposition and so you have to go for what conservatism is conservatism will describe you know it's yeah and i'm realizing that my podcast is kind of like that I keep saying so we've done this before but anyway so we've dug into the idea of standpoint epistemology in the podcast before and uh, i'll just give you a brief outline now so that's the, essentially the idea that uh, some people are capable of or they have or they have access to a special kind of knowledge right because of their socio economic or political uh position i e their standpoint right hence standpoint epistemology right and this might also be referred to as one's lived experience that's probably a term that you're most familiar with right um so that's the notion that your lived experience makes you a better candidate right in this case in this example um your lived experience makes you a better candidate for a judicial seat right because of what you know uh, because of your socio economic or political standpoint because of your identity right your political identity and that notion is downright flawed um because as i said a little bit earlier on as 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 i alluded to a little bit earlier what ought to make you a better candidate for the position of justice on the bench of an apex court is evidence of your legal acumen right evidence of your legal discernment spanning a career that demonstrates um not just not just your legal acumen uh demonstrates your expertise in a range of areas in a range of legal areas and matters right so that should be the standard objectively regardless of who you are um your legal acumen legal discernment um experience spanning years spanning areas we we need to see range man we need to see that you got this okay um it can't be put down to your or at least not even because I I I I don't want to misconstrue and I hate it when people make straw straw men of of the opposition's arguments and then you know try to try to swipe down the straw man I'm not trying to do that here so I understand it's not just about the identity they're not going to take uh someone who doesn't even have the 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 minimum qualification and put them in just cuz they're black and they're female but the point is when you, when your starting point when your point of departure 
is that you are looking for a black woman or a woman or a black person that in itself is a problem because in terms of the role in terms of what that person is supposed to do their identity doesn't actually matter it's inconsequential um and so regardless of who you are personally that should be the standard right we actually need to know that you have the right experience that you have the right um the acumen that we're looking for that you are discerning that you have range right um in 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 the areas that we need to read your judgments we need to hear the way that you the way that you actually navigate legal issues right uh, the way that you navigate legal mat- matrixes right matrixes matrices matrixes oh this is going to bother me i think it's matrixes uh, but we need to hear right we need to hear how you negotiate difficult issues right N- difficult uh, issues as it relates to judicial interpretation and if your experience if your history if your cv doesn't prove that to us right without us either reading your name or seeing a picture of you then unfortunately you just you shouldn't be able to make the cut that is that should be the standard because that is most objective let me know what you think this idea particularly of standpoint epistemology do you believe that some people just have access to um are capable of or have this um a special kind of knowledge you need kind of knowledge purely based off of um their standpoint purely based off of their identity i'm interested to hear your thoughts leave them in the comments while i get into free stuff in free stuff today um rejoice in those things that do not change Um I've had this sitting in my heart for about a day or so now um because I'm at a point <laughs> in my life where a lot of things are changing sorry I'm just chuckling there because I'm remembering if you've been keeping an eye on my YouTube page you know that there's a, a series kind of that I began a few days ago not a series so much but a um yeah another kind of um kind of content video content that I've been putting up that's uh, it's actually it might may seem a little schizophrenic because I'm not <laughs> uh like this I I share I share a different kind of myself a uh, different part of myself um in that one and so uh but I just say that I say that to point to the fact that um in there i speak a lot more about the space that i'm in and all the changes that i'm going through um and so i've had to in recent times just uh remind myself that i need to rejoice in the, in those things that don't change particularly uh because i also need to remember not to take for granted that things change right uh i need to be able to accept that things change um i need to also be able to to um appreciate even as i enjoy things as i have things um that things do change they will change so that when they do um i'm not so cut up about it right when things end and things change and uh people leave and you know um seasons come to an end for me not to grow so attached right to them um to a point where i don't i don't conduct myself as if um this will always be here um and this will always be the situation and this will always be the case so rejoice in those things that don't change for me that's god right god's faithfulness um uh that's also family you know there may be other things for you that don't change but for me it's god and family absolutely because there there've been things that i thought uh were tied to my identity that would never change but i've i'm learning i'm i'm someone who changes quite a lot um if you've heard me speak about myself and my views you'll know that i've traversed <laughs> the spe- the was the whole spectrum of um spiritual positions political positions um social positions i guess as well economic positions so um and not personally i'm on my way to being rich still so i haven't had that experience yet but in terms of ideology right in terms of beliefs um uh, economic beliefs and positions i've um I've, i've i've made lots of moves right so i'm someone who's uh, well acquainted with a lot of change i'm also very adaptable because i've been forced to 
make do with a lot of change because of what life has just put me through, right? Because of the hand that I've been dealt, the different hands that I've been dealt throughout my life. I've just had to learn to adapt. Um, and I've, I've, I've thankfully been able to exercise that, exercise that muscle of adaptability. Um, and so um, it's, it's sometimes jarring because sometimes I just keep hoping that, oh, not this thing as well. Oh, I can't lose this thing as well, you know. Uh, but I have to learn to remain in the consciousness that, you know what, things change um, and then allow myself to rejoice in those things that don't change because it will also allow me to enjoy things that change, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make them any less meaningful. Um, but those things that don't change at least act as an anchor so that I don't feel so displaced when the things that do change do change, right? Um, and so God is an incredible anchor to have because God is permanent and he's, um, he, he's beyond time and space and um, he created the universe and he's sovereign and um, his authority is final. So uh, God is better than family in that context, right? Uh, but it also gives you a sense of comfort. It gives me a sense of comfort, right? Uh, so not just in terms of not feeling displaced, uh, but also in, in, sen in the sense of... Um, a kind of continu a continuation, uh, you know, a, a continuousness. There is a sense of coherence in everything that's happening. There's a sense of coherence in the change, in all the change, in all the transition, um, you know, because there is an anchor, right? There is a logic to it all. There is a plan to it all. There is a design to it all. Um, and so you don't have to understand it, but at least you get that comfort, right? Um, and I always try to, to tie this to, to scripture because um, I learn my lessons. Uh, most of the lessons I learn, I learn from scripture. And um, for this particular uh, free stuff, the idea of an anchor and of things that don't change takes me straight back to Psalm 137, 5 and 6. Um, if I ever forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem to be my highest joy. That speaks to, I mean, if you understand the context of Jerusalem, if you understand what Jerusalem means to the children of Israel, right, um, and the context in which that scripture was written, um, you know, it was written at a time where uh, the children of Israel were about to be exiled, right, uh, by the Babylonians to Babylon, right? Um, and they had, they had spent years and years being, oh my gosh, the Israelites were so stubborn. They were such a stubborn people and God loved them relentlessly. Oh my God, as he does. But so, yeah, they were being unfaithful and they weren't following um, his, his instructions and his dictates and all the promises that they themselves had made under their leaders who led them out of Egypt and into and through, I mean, through uh, the, the, the deserts and uh, into ultimately into Jerusalem, settling into the promised land. So they get there and essentially they get too comfortable. They forget what God said. Um, and so, but, but this idea of Jerusalem um, having been that promised land and having been a, a sign and a symbol of God's faithfulness and God's love and the height, really the glory of Israel, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's, um, for me, that's a great reminder and that's a great uh, picture for, for that idea of rejoicing in things that don't change because God's faithfulness doesn't change um, and God as an anchor um, in terms of... Uh, keeping the children of, of, of Israel even in Babylon, right? Um, when you read the book of Jeremiah as well, um, about how, how I mean, just, oh, okay, I don't want to, it's just beautiful, but I'm just actually thinking about it, that even in exile, right? And not even just in exile, even when they were still in Jerusalem and they were doing the most, like, if you, you need to read the Bible, like, the Bible is so lit, <laughs> It's so lit. It's riveting stuff, to be quite honest. But essentially, yeah, so that would be the scripture, uh, Psalm 137, uh, 5 and 6, uh, if I ever forget you, Jerusalem, um, if I ever forget um, my anchor, if I ever forget 
um, what was behind Jerusalem, right? If I ever forget the feet that was Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill, right? If I ever forget what it took, if I ever forget, I mean, we could, yeah, we could, um, but try to rejoice in those things that don't change. I'm trying to um, apply that lesson in my life as well. And I'm hoping to hear how that looks in your life. I'll be sharing those thoughts for me um, in terms of how that looks for me in that other video. So go over to Her Life as Lele, uh, the playlist Her Life as Lele. Go and check out uh, more in-depth, the kind of unscripted, not a very put-together kind of um, uh, part segment uh, of the channel i guess if you're if you're looking for that side of me go over that side and join me there but otherwise i'm going to be waiting to hear from you in terms of how you apply this in the comment section please remember to do that because as you know as you should know if you've been around for long enough these conversations don't end when the episode does they continue in the comments and i always enjoy hearing your feedback but until next time please breathe deeply okay and drink water and of course pray it's been an absolute pleasure for me to spend time with you i've been so excited um to it's taken quite a few takes to do this so i'm, I'm actually really keen <laughs> about this one I've, it's been it's been a great one it's been I've, i have had a bash uh, in this episode so let me hear your thoughts um about how this episode went and your insights regarding not just um the judicial appointments um, and the role of justices and particularly that issue of diversity and transformation on court benches but also the idea of having um, those things that remain permanent and those things that not only um, remain permanent but keep you grounded right because that's also another role of an anchor until next time i've been lele mutari i've had an absolute blast spending time with you and i can't wait to do it again but until then stay blessed Ah. Uh.